Hey guys. Um, so I'm Edwin, and today I'll be talking to you about scaling data products under startup constraints. Um, but you know, we all have constraints, so you don't have to work at a startup. If you uh, have problem hiring, have problem getting resources or servers, you know, this hopefully could be applicable as well. So a little bit about me. I've been a startup person uh, my entire career. Um, I have uh, founded uh, two companies that uh, went through the whole startup um, cycle, you know, venture funding to, to the first prototype to um, market fit to eventual acquisition. And through those uh, lessons, I've learned kind of the, the constraints that uh, are available at the startups and what to do about them. So today I work at Tiny Data, which is a small data studio. Uh, we help other companies make data products, and we also make a couple of data products of our own. So the case study that I'll be taking you guys through today is testing machine learning in production. Um, and it's a journey that we, uh, we took uh, you know, fairly recently. Um, if you guys are familiar with machine learning, you know that kind of the modern machine learning tool chain, um, the TensorFlow, the PyTorch of the world, um, they have a very research-heavy slant. And I think that's really a function of the academic bent of a lot of the researchers at uh, makers of these companies. Uh, more recently, there have been more tools uh, for deploying machine learning in production. So every framework today has a model server. Um, if you guys are familiar with them, uh, they are a little bit like a web server, for, but for machine learning models. So instead of deploying a web page, you deploy a trained model. Now, a lot of the testing tools for machine learning um, are really focused on the training aspect. So, for example, in uh, TensorFlow, there's a data validation tool that you can use to find and fill uh, missing data, um, kind of solving the data downtime problem that uh, Bar talked about yesterday. Um, but for uh, servers in production, there are far fewer tools. Um, some of you may be wondering, well, do you really need specific tools to test machine learning servers in production? Why can't you use existing tools? You know, why can't you use a standard monitoring tool like Datadog to see if your machine learning uh, server is up and running? And I think the reason um, is that machine learning is fundamentally different. Um, you know, machine learning is, is different from traditional software in a fundamental way. So traditional software, here's a web page um, presenting a very popular uh, PDF download today. Um, uh, the, the server stayed up most of the day, though, so it's, you know, I don't know what they're using. But if everything is running correctly, and I request a web page, I should be able to download the, the report, I should be able to get a 200 status code. So it's very deterministic. If something is wrong, I could get a different error code. If a uh, wrong report is downloaded, you know, that means that there's a bug in the system. It's you know, something that we can fix, and, uh, and, and we should. So it's, it's very clear. If you run a cluster of containers, um, there are even ways for you to um, you know, check for health uh, and check for lifeness. So, and you can restart them if something goes wrong. So for traditional servers, you know, things are pretty good. But machine learning outcomes are slightly different. So let's just say that I'm running an uh, image recognition system, and I'm trying to figure out if a picture is a dog or a muffin. Uh, if the server has never seen one of these pictures before, it can never really know for sure, for sure. You know, it looks like a dog, probably is a dog. I'll give it a good 90% uh, probability. But we don't really know for sure, for sure. And that's really um, the kind of premise of modern machine learning. And it gets trickier uh, when we have new versions. So in machine learning, you often want to retrain your models and deploy a new version. Um, or you actually want to be fancier and do online training, which means that as new data comes in, your uh, parameters change and your, uh, your server will actually return results. So two versions of the same, uh, two versions uh, might return slightly different uh, results for this picture. Now, recently, a lot of the larger infrastructure companies are working to provide uh, kind of end-to-end -end machine learning platforms. So this is a, uh, a new product launched by Google recently. Uh, call, uh, it's called AI Platform, and it takes you through all the different uh, parts of a machine learning lifecycle. And it kind of stops at, you can see that a lot of uh, 
work happens before uh, deployment. You know, you train, you develop, you organize your data, you analyze. But the picture kind of stops at the deployment level. But this is not what we're doing today for other types of servers, right? We have a lot of testing in production. We even have chaos engineering where we try to engineer disturbances uh, to see how systems react. Um, but today, that's not available for machine learning. So we went about uh, a, a project of building a production machine learning testing tool. And we had three requirements for that. One is that we wanted to be able to generate new inputs against, machine, uh, against model servers. So given a model, we want to be able to generate new unseen inputs into the systems at the production level. Two, we want to record uh, outputs from the models. And three, we want to be able to uh, have a feedback loop where the outputs can be fed back into the, the training system. Um, today, I'll mostly be talking about number one, which is kind of the steps we took to engineer new outputs against model servers. And you know, doing that is actually particularly hard as a startup. We need two things that we, we didn't have access to. We need model servers that are not toy-based. We need real robust model servers so that we can do testing. And, it, and then we need access to you know, real generated real data uh, just so that we can see what the outcomes are. In terms of you know, using a model server, you know, if you, uh, you know, open a TensorFlow and do a hello world, you, you know, there's, there's a few toy models you can work with. But they're toy models, right? They're not really robust enough for uh, doing testing. So the, the way that we went around this constraint, instead of you know, spending time building um, and training our own model, is actually to skip a step. We realized that there were a ton of non-toy model servers out there in the form of commercial API services. Uh, so these vendors all provide different types of cloud AI services, uh, from text analysis to translation uh, to image recognition. And the image recognition services are uh, interesting in that you know, they're the easiest thing, way, ways for us to look to see whether something is working or not. You know, they're visual. So I'm going to talk about them. Uh, the systems from the vendors uh, themselves, they are for the most part opaque. You know, they work pretty well, but we don't really know why they work. We don't know what the training uh, data set that they use are. And we also you know, don't know really you know, what's the a real success rate internally. Um, they all have common features. You know, there's scene detection, uh, facial recognition, text detection, um, and, the, and also facial analysis. Now, one of the features of facial analysis is gender detection. So given a picture, uh, the service will find a face. Given a face, uh, the service will figure out what it can about that particular face, including gender. There is a um, research project called Gender Shades that uh, has highlighted uh, the, the challenges these systems have had um, classifying genders for people of color. You know, very specifically, uh, for women of color, uh, there's a way higher chance of getting misgendered than for um, a white woman. So if you are a, person, a woman of color, um, and you use uh, a system from IBM or from AWS, there's a higher chance that you are classified as a man. So we're interested in actually taking the gender shade study a little further and look at um, gender bias from a different point of view. You know, can we find other systems, uh, other cases where the trained systems fail? So the you know, hypothesis here is pretty straightforward that gender labels that these systems provide are trained on traditional images. So if we present non-traditional images, they're not going to work well. So you know, they are, again, this is our internal model that they, the training data is mostly uh, trained on very specific um, traditional data. And we are interested in testing the systems with non-traditional data. So for example, um, the hypothesis that most uh, labeled males that the systems have probably have short hair. 
So here we have a picture of Alex Anzalone, who is a 6'3", 240-pound uh, NFL linebacker. And we're interested in what the systems think it, you know, he is. So here we are using Amazon's recognition system. And you know, give, the facial analysis says that there's a 79% chance that he uh, should be classified as female. Let's try the opposite. Rachel Meadow, who was born biologically female and identifies herself as a woman. And I, AWS says there's, you know, uh, she's more likely to be a man. So, but I, AWS is not alone. Here we are looking at Watson, the service from IBM. And IBM thinks that she's a man at a higher percentage. Is it, you know, is that something about her face that makes the system, uh, you know, misclassify her? So let's take a look at a different picture. Here's a picture of, uh, of the same person uh, from years ago, uh, but you know, in this case, she has long blonde hair. And this is Ibn Watson, uh, who's which is classifying Rachel Meadow as a female with 100% certainty. So that's a very, very strong certainty here. So you know, one question that this brings up is, are these systems actually doing facial analysis? The faces to me you know, look very similar. Um, and yet, uh, the classifications are entirely different. You know, why is that? I actually, you know, the, again, the hypothesis here is that it's the presentation of the hair and it's the glasses. So, you know, these are kind of uh, one-off examples that I'm giving, but uh, we really want to test the systems in bulk. You know, we don't want to give them a couple images that we find on the internet. We want to give them um, thousands or tens of thousands of images and get the results back. So as a startup, how do we generate the data? I think the good news for us is that, again, you know, there's constraints. We don't have a large internally labeled data set, but the internet exists. So whether it's you know, Creative Commons uh, images from Flickr or a very well-labeled list of people from Wikipedia, there are tons of sources that we could use. And this is a playbook that I've used before. Uh, one of my startups uh, in the past, Cast TV, uh, focused on video data. Uh, so we prototyped the initial product using an open source uh, TV episode guide called um, App Guides. Um, and you know, it got us going with the first product. Um, and eventually, that product is now the global standard uh, for you know, TV. So if you use Comcast, that data um, you know, it's from the same company that uh, you know, I founded, but the original source was an open source database. So with this playbook, uh, we went about uh, generating data. Um, so on Wikipedia, I, I have a list of people. Uh, from that, I can get a list of women. From that, I can get specific women. You know, here, we have a, uh, a singer with short hair. And there are multiple images of, of her on Wikipedia. And we can um, kind of scale out uh, with the analysis rather than doing one off. We can now do them in bulk. And again, you know, the systems are too predictable. Again, you know, with the short hair, she's classified as male. So uh, you know, there are a few more examples I want to show. Here's a man with long hair, more likely to be female. Here's another man with long hair more likely to be female. And you know, we want to try other things, right? Here's a man with makeup. So the hair presentation is now um, you know, not the issue here. Um, so I think this is a clarify, uh, classifying this person as a woman with pretty high certainty. And here's a man with makeup, you know, not a feminine makeup in any way, but makeup. And again, fairly certain to be a female. So, and, and last, you know, another uh, person with makeup. So it's very clear that uh, the, if you were to, you know, again, those systems are black boxes. We don't really know how they work. 
But if you were to hypothesize how they actually work, you would imagine data sets where uh, faces with makeups are labeled women, you know, faces with long hair outside the boundary areas are labeled women, and faces with short hair are labeled men. And we were able to kind of have uh, confirmed that by automating our data generation and testing. Um, here is a screenshot of our tool. Um, you can see that um, the different services uh, are listed on the top, AWS uh, and so forth. And we have uh, images on the left and uh, the return results from the uh, various services. And if the results are uh, in red, uh, then uh, the images are misclassified. So testing all these services in bulk required us um, to write a common API. Um, so you know, internally, we just have a common API that can go out and test any, uh, um, to any of the services. And we can write special plugins uh, for, for the uh, intermediate layer, um, just so that we can add new services very easily. Um, you know, nothing really changes on our, on our internal end. So here's, uh, I think in this case, this is a screenshot of us testing uh, women with short hair wearing glasses. And you know, that is really tough for the commercial services. You know, so why is this helpful? Well, beyond kind of being able to pinpoint um, the issues uh, that we find, that uh, we are also storing the results over time. And this means that um, if you're running a machine learning service, now you have a scalable, predictable, and very automated way of testing your model server's uh, progress over time. And again, you know, these are images that haven't been seen in training. Um, and the reason why that's important is that uh, the, you know, the systems will do fairly well for uh, images seen in training, but that's not how real life machine learning works. You know. Amazon recognition is not going to have seen every picture that a user submits. So the takeaways for us from the machine learning side is that even the best trained commercial systems, again, this is a system built by some of the best people in the industry, are far from perfect. And you know, it's, it's a very, very hard problem, right? Trying to recognize everyone in the world, that, that's a hard thing to do. Um, and I think that's maybe the reason why Google is actually not in the mix. You know, if you use Google's commercial image recognition system, you cannot get a gender label out of it, um, but the other systems provide it. And you know, they are uh, the ven the ve vendors are more or less uh, responsive to uh, research from folks like um, Tiny Data and other people. Um, IBM, for example, is actually taking the initiative to um, open source some of its training data just so that we can take a look at the data and figure out why the systems are working the way they are. Uh, some vendors are less uh, open to that. And obviously, with uh, some of the images that we've seen here, you know, there are larger um, ethical and societal issues. As machine learning becomes more and more prevalent, I think uh, the press or in the media um, as a way of making this probabilistic model that is almost by definition imperfect uh, into this uh, something different, right? Into AI, this uh, thing that returns the right results every time. So, you know, clearly, if systems are returning different results over time as new versions get deployed, deployers of machine learning systems are going to need uh, to really manage and control it a little more. And you know, that's going to be intractable and cumbersome to test without tools and automation. Already, already the data governance um, on the training side is, is complicated. Um, you add kind of real life data from, um, from the wild into the mix. And again, you need tools and automation. So as a startup, um, you know, kind of our takeaways always have been that, you know, we need to, we should skip the steps that we don't need to build that have been built before. So now in this case, you know, we've bootstrapped servers with commercial APIs. 
and you know, we bootstrap uh, the data that we've used to test uh, the systems uh, from the open web, from uh, public data sources. And you know, we did that for the image uh, recognition domain. For other domains um, that are different, that are popular in machine learning, uh, whether it is um, credit scoring or other types of predictions, um, you know, there's in an increasingly uh, um, large body of work around synthetic data generation. And that's actually a talk uh, yesterday. If you, you guys were here from um, Andrew from Tonic, where, they talk, you know, where he talked about you know, how to generate data. So if you're a startup and you need data, you know, it's out there on the web or you can make it. And finally, you know, automation is really startup's best friend. Uh, you know, we were able to, you know, I guess you know, Kubernetes doesn't really care whether you are one person or 100 people. You can you know, launch a, a thousand uh, servers the, it, with the same ease. But as a startup, you just have to remember to shut them down. Otherwise, it's, you know, it's expensive. So anyway, um, this is kind of uh, a quick talk sharing our journey, um, trying to test machine learning as a, in a very small team. Um, you can reach me on Twitter at Edwin, or send me an email, or we have lots of time for some questions, I think. Um, so what would you do for um, problems that are not classification problems? So like, for example, recommendations where there's no right recommendation. Um, instead of, you know, mm -hmm. it's a yes or no. Yeah, so I, th I think it gets, definitely gets trickier with, uh, you know, a, a recommendation where you don't know whether it's actually right. Um, I think that the first part, you know, you can still do the data generation part. You can still have a visual way of seeing uh, what the outcomes are and, may, um, and then you can still feed the data back. Um, but it's not so black and white. But you can actually, um, we found in one use case where the visualization, letting people see, oh, here are the recommended um, products um, were helpful because the, the data editors could visually say, oh, that's right, or that seems really off. Um, so the, the first part, yeah, so it's still helpful, but not in the same way. Any other questions? Uh, I had one question. Sure. Uh, one of your takeaway points was that automation is a startup's best friend, but at the same time, automation has a lot of costs associated mm -hmm. with it. When do you recommend people look to automating, startups look to automating things versus uh, doing things in a one-off fashion? You know, I think it's the trade-off is, is uh, you know, time is a big trade-off here, right? It may take, if it takes you, uh, a couple hours to automate something uh, that only requires um, 10 minutes of work a week is not worth it. Um, so in our cases, we definitely look at automation when it's a clear time saver. But there's just things that, you know, as, as, a, you know, as users, you just can't fire off, you know, a thousand image requests to Google um, an hour. It's just hard. Uh, you just can't use the UI to do that. So in, in cases where um, the alternative is not doing it, then it's very clear. You know, if you can't do it without automation, then automation has to be the only option. 